All right. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I hope you all are enjoying the conference as much as I am. I was in the last session here in, in the auditorium, and I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I've seen a lot of sessions online. So we, you know, we, we like it just as much as you do. And we really appreciate you all coming today to the Hirshhorn and, and also to everyone that's, that's tuning in online to watch it from, uh, from their home. Uh, before we get into the talk today, I just wanted you all to know that uh, in this auditorium at 3 o'clock, they're going to have a keynote uh, with the LA, LA Unified School District uh, collaboration that they did with the Fender Music Corporation. And uh, they gifted uh, almost 20,000 students instruments, education, and inspiration. And, and you get to hear about that collaboration and partnership, and you also get to hear from two of those students, uh, and maybe I heard there's some Bruno Mars something something, so uh, be sure not to miss that. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for welcoming the stage. My name's Cody Coltharp. Uh, quick verbal description, uh, I'm, a, I'm a goofy kind of looking Caucasian guy. I'm wearing a blue shirt, I have blonde hair. Uh, I'm live at the Hirshhorn Auditorium uh, with a lot of people here to see mostly Dr. Nancy Knowlton talk. I'm one of them. Um, I'm so glad you all came today. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a digital interactive designer here at the Smithsonian. I've, I've been here for about 10 years. Uh, before that, I was in informal and formal classrooms for about 10 years. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm one of about 300 plus educators here at the Smithsonian that you know, we really take it serious to, 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 to tell the Smithsonian story by, by taking all the resources and the objects that we have and um, supporting schools and families with those resources all around the world. And uh, yeah, we, we, you know, it's a serious business for us and we do our best. Uh, today I'll be joined by the legendary Dr. Nancy Knowlton. Y'all, I'm excited, I hope you are. Uh, um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch this over so you can see her full title. Um, she's an absolute legend in the marine science world. She's a coral reef ecologist. She's an academic mentor. She's one of the founders of the Earth Optimism Movement. She's an author. Citizens of the Sea is a book she wrote. It's really fun. My kids love it. Uh, the titles go on and on and on. She deserves every single bit of accolades that she's gotten. Uh, but working with her during this project that I did with her, I've, I've also found that she's an incredibly kind and humble person. And uh, I, I really am just honored to, to share the stage with her today. Uh, some, some quick uh, housekeeping for the folks that are tuned in online today. Uh, there is some, some closed captioning that's happening live. Um, you can access that by hitting the CC icon in the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's also live ASL interpreter um, that will be penned in the top right of your window. And uh, I, I want to thank you both so much for all the work that you've been doing throughout the entire summit. We really do appreciate that. And uh, also to those tuned in, um, there's a Q&A column all the way on the right. Feel free to, to put in any question you have for, for Dr. Knowlton or myself in that column, and we'll do our best to answer. Uh, all right, so that's the housekeeping. I'm going to go on to the agenda next. Uh, so what you're going to hear today, I'm going to go over uh, a project called Secrets of the Sea, and it'll be a quick overview. Um, then I will pass the mic to Dr. Knowlton, and she will give a talk about the, the role that we all have to play in, in a, a, a global changing environment. When we're done with that, we'll switch over to the Q&A part and go over any questions that you all have, uh, either here in the audience or live and online. All right, so objective of today. Other than this objective, uh, we have our, our, our own like secondary objective, and that is kind of to, to honor Dr. Knowlton and, and uh, to highlight the work that she's done. Um, you know, I've been here a long time. The Smithsonian is, is really well known for all the stuff that we have, the artwork, the artifacts, the specimen. Um, but, but being here, I've also met these really incredible historians and curators and educators and scientists like, like Dr. Knowlton that are able to take all that, that stuff that we have and the, the research that we have and weave all that together to tell this kind of magical learning journey uh, that you all experience here at the Smithsonian. It's your experience when you're going into a museum. Um, so, you know, I, I really want to kind of honor these people uh, because their unique perspectives are, are 
the ones that are kind of driving that story. So who are these people, right? Who are these people behind the doors and sometimes in front of the stage? Um, the project that I'm going to be sharing today is a, just one of three of a, a series that we have done um, that, that tells the story of some really fantastic uh, Smithsonian women scientists here that are doing this really innovative, cutting edge, uh, really incredible science. Um, and each of the projects uh, tell a little bit about that scientist, her work, uh, what it means, why, sh why they do it, and tries to simulate some of that science um, in the classroom. So left to right, uh, Dr. Kimberly Arcan, she's a data visualization scientist, um, Dr. Nancy Knowlton in the middle, and Dr. Rachel Page, who studies predator-prey interactions. Uh, so it's just one of the three. Um, they're all really fun, and uh, I'll, I'll go over the first one right now. Uh, so this project is called Secrets of the Sea, and uh, there's a, a quick overview of the project, but all three are follow the same kind of overview. Um, there's a classroom activity. In the classroom activity, it ranges from high-touch to high-tech uh, classroom-type um, activities that you can do. In addition to that, there's also uh, an online interactive that the students can play that simulates that scientist's work. And also there's a video biography about the scientist and, and her work and, and why that work matters. All right, so we'll go into the classroom activity first. Uh, I, I like to kind of start with why. You know, why are we doing this? Uh, speaking with teachers often, uh, one of the questions we get is, you know, how do we get our kids to care, right? This climate change is this massive problem and they just kind of feel powerless and hopeless and like, you know, what do we, what do, we do to get our, our kids to feel like they, they have a voice or they have some, some agency in this? And in addition to that, uh, you know, Dr. Knowlton, how do we do it without focusing on the doom and gloom part, that feeling of hopelessness? Because Dr. Knowlton's whole thing is, is about giving that agency and giving that power to, to everyone and showing that role that we all can, can do. And so that's kind of the, the why of why we did this and, and what drives every bit of the, the kind of learning objectives that you're going to see today. All right. So I'm going to real briefly go over the classroom activity. It's um, I have a much longer walkthrough that's like an hour long if, if you're interested, but I'll give a, a kind of a Cliff's Notes version of it. Um, this is the, uh, the, the launch page of The Secrets of the Sea, and uh, as you can see, there are these the three elements that I talked about. Uh, on the far left is the online interactivity, uh, online interactive. In the middle is the biographical video of Dr. Knowlton. On the right is the uh, interactive classroom activities. And so we'll go through that real quick. Uh, this is the Smithsonian Learning Lab platform. I don't know if you're familiar with it, uh, but it's an amazing platform for, for sharing content. Um, this, uh, all of these activities in, in uh, this platform or in this collection are next generation science standards aligned to fourth and fifth grade. And it's roughly broken into these, these six horizontal bars. And you can see there's those kind of like bookends that are all the same color. Um, but the Cliff's Notes version of this collection is that first, they're going to learn about coral reefs and the life that those reefs support. They're going to learn a little bit about how uh, a, a climate uh, changing ocean affects the, the, the creatures that live in the reef. They'll play the online interactive, um, Secrets of the Sea, and then they'll come back for some reflective questions, and also they'll hear some really fun, interesting stories of groups of people that have uh, been doing things to make real impact um, and positive changes on the environment. And in addition to that, at the end, there's also uh, Dr. Knowlton's online biographical video. Well, they'll, they'll learn a little bit about her, they'll learn a little bit about her work, um, and they'll also be introduced to the next generation of, uh, of scientists and researchers that she's mentored that are um, studying uh, the, human, the human effect on, on the oceans. So that's, the, that's the, on, uh, the, the, the classroom activities in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and go on to the interactive game next. Um, so Secrets of the Sea, uh, some, some quick logistics about the game. We know in schools, you, teachers often struggle with you know, downloading a, a game or, or don't have access to being able to download things. So this is entirely browser-based, totally free. Uh, the, the package is really small. It's only like 50 megabytes, so it, it's pretty quick to, uh, to run on even slow computers. 
and uh, Dr. Knowlton narrates the entire thing. We spent about four hours in a booth one day, and um, you get to hear her voice in, in just a second. So I'm going to play a quick uh, walkthrough, and I'll go through kind of what the game is and what it does. Um, Okay, so this is the online interactive. Uh, I've skipped ahead a little bit. I, there's an introduction scene, but I've skipped past that, just so you can kind of see it. Um, in this game, you're navigating this coral reef, and what you're seeing are, are actual 3D scans of uh, the Smithsonian's coral collections. Um, but in the scene, you're, you're kind of wandering around, you're navigating, and you're seeing these white uh, kind of bleached out um, specimen and, and as you get closer you can see it kind of gives those specimen um, color and that is uh, kind of a metaphor for where you have this bleached out like colorless reef and as the students are navigating and, and exploring and discovering more things about it they're learning more about it they're kind of bringing that reef back to life and, and giving it um, uh, uh, bringing it back to, to being able to support more and more sea life so as the student navigates, uh, there's some seagrass ahead. If, for example, they find four seagrass, um, a sea star will appear somewhere in the scene for them to find, and they'll have to navigate around and find that. And if they find the sea star, then more and more diverse uh, creatures will come, and that's representative of uh, the, the reef being able to sustain a more and more diverse um, uh, uh, series of, of specimen. If you hit the tab at any time, you can see this is kind of that, that complex food web and everything that, uh, that depends on other things for being able to be sustained in the reef. Um, the question mark ones, those are ones that haven't been able to be found yet, and if you click on that, it'll tell you what's needed, uh, what dependencies are needed for them to be found. Uh, if you find all of the species, you, you completely, you see that was three of six, uh, four of six of this one. If you find everything, then there's a really fun kind of cut scene where Dr. Knowlton will, narr will narrate a little bit about, uh, about that. And um, if you fully, completely recover the reef uh, and show that it's, it's fully capable of sustaining um, all the sea life uh, from everything from the bottom to the to apex predators, it'll, it'll play a fun cut scene um, that Dr. Knowlton narrates. Uh, so, so that's the interactive. Um, when they're done with this, uh, it takes about 30 minutes. They'll go back into that learning lab collection. And again, those reflection questions and seeing the examples of those that have made an impact. And, um, and hopefully at the end, uh, we often will show the biographical video of Dr. Knowlton because they'll say, like, you know, who's this person narrating? You know, who, it's all about her work. Who is she? We'll show that video and show that she's this, you know, this amazing person. Uh, but she's actually here today. So I'm going to give her the stage, and she can talk all about uh, her work herself. Um, can you give me a, a quick warm welcome for Dr. Knowlton uh, as she takes the stage? Let's click through here. Okay. Oops, sorry, one more. That's the video bagger. There you go. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, that was an amazing, I think that's the nicest introduction I've ever had. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> Try to live up to at least a part of it. Um, so I, I love the ocean. And I've loved the ocean ever since I was a kid. I love the beauty of all the creatures that live in it and the crazy way they make a living. There's so many different kinds, so many different wild uh, lifestyles. It's just, and there's so much to learn. There's, most of the creatures in the ocean we actually have never studied as scientists. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to study as a marine scientist. And, uh, and I also love to share my knowledge and love of the ocean with other people. That's why I wrote this book. I actually wrote it, I thought, for um, grown-ups, whatever that means. I tend to think of scientists as basically people who don't ever grow up, but in any case, I had sort of people more my age or, you know, sort of 20s, 30s, but it turns out if you look at the reviews on Amazon, uh, I've got a big fan base in the 3 to 12-year-old sector, and so if you, any of you have budding Jack Cousteau's in your audience, I highly recommend this book. And it's also my way of um, Play, paying forward, if you will, because the reason I could take uh, my love of the ocean uh, and turn it into a lifelong career was because of all the teachers and mentors I had. So um, this is one of the first things I did when I uh, joined the, um, the Natural History Museum. 
Now, another thing that is amazing about the ocean is that it's so big. It covers 70% of the surface of the planet, and because it's so deep, it's about 95% of the habitable real estate. Now, that's a, you get a sense of wonder and awe when you think about how large the ocean is, uh, but it also led, in a way, to a kind of complacency. The ocean was so big that we, for many, for centuries, really, we felt there was nothing we could do to harm it. Uh, there was, people were just too small relative to how big the ocean was for us to have any impact at all. Now, unfortunately, uh, that has not turned out to be the case. And in particular, as has been mentioned a number of times in the summit, uh, climate change is having an impact on the Earth as a whole and on the ocean itself. And here you see a, a chart of what's happening to ocean temperatures uh, going from 1960s on the left to the 2020s uh, on the right, and red is hot and blue is cold, and you can see that the oceans uh, since about 1990 has been getting steadily warmer and warmer and warmer. But you don't really need a chart like this to know that the ocean's getting warmer. All you have to do is read the newspaper, or if you live in Florida, just go in the ocean, as I'm sure some of you have read. The ocean right now uh, is in the, is in the ninth realm of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's like a hot bath at this point. So for many, many people, they're actually physically experiencing the heat of the ocean. Now, in some ways, um, this, the fact that the ocean can absorb so much heat has been a good thing for us, who, those of us who live on the land, like people um, and other terrestrial creatures, because it's meant that the earth is actually, the, the dry part of the earth has actually been a little bit cooler than it would have been if it was absorbing all the heat itself. So the ocean has sort of taken some of the pressure in the, in the sense of, of heating off the land and absorbed it into the ocean. But this is actually a, a, not a good thing overall. And it's not good for ocean life, and it's not good for people. I spent my career studying coral reefs. Coral reefs, they live in the tropics, so you'd think they'd like hot water. But they only like water so a, a certain temperature. And if it gets even a couple of degrees warmer than what they're used to, they go through something called coral bleaching, the relationship between the coral animal and the tiny little plant cells that live in their tissues breaks down. And so that's what gives the coral its color. So the co corals turn this ghostly white. Um, but it's, um, and they look kind of beautiful in a way, but they're actually starving to death. It's not a good thing. And often, um, sometimes they can recover, but often they, they die from this hot, hot water. And what you see on the right, uh, this is from the Great Barrier Reef in uh, 2016, 2017, when there was a ton of coral bleaching. The slimy seaweeds grow all over the skeleton, and eventually they actually just crumble and turn into sand. So, and, and corals aren't the only thing that are hurt by the fact when the water gets so, so hot, but people are also being hurt by this hot water. And in particular, uh, hurricanes are much more powerful now. Um, as a function of the, of the heat in the ocean. Basically, ocean heat is the, is the fuel for hurricanes. So the warmer the ocean is, the more powerful they can become and the more quickly they can grow into really mega storms. Uh, and these winds, of course, are incredibly damaging, but even almost worse than the high winds, the winds get all the attention, but worse than the winds in, one, in many ways is the fact that all that heat allows the oceans to store much more moisture. And so you wind up with these uh, torrential downpours, uh, really unprecedented events where hurricanes stall and just dump literally buckets of rain on communities like, you, like happened to Houston, which is what you uh, see in this picture and in many places around the world. So a warming ocean is not a good thing either for ocean life or for people. And of course, it's not, I mean, I've been talking about climate change as one of the themes of the summit. But, um, but there are other things we're doing uh, to the ocean as well, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, we're polluting the ocean with plastics, which of course are made from, foss uh, from fossil fuels ultimately. This picture actually is particularly um, kind of resonates with me in a kind of sad way because I spent 14 years living uh, in that city there, that's Panama City. I work for the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama studying coral reefs. And this is a picture of a typical scene in Panama City or, or the outskirts of Panama City. And of course, for us as humans, it's kind of just disgusting. But for ocean life, it's often fatal. They either eat, eat it thinking that they mistake it for food or they get entangled with it and, uh, and drown. So it's definitely not a good thing. And of course, the other thing we're doing is stripping so much life out of the ocean uh, at a rate that, that ocean life simply can't replace itself. So there are, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of things 
that are happening to the ocean. And to sort of to summarize this, it's kind of setting the stage part of what I wanted to say, uh, what's happening to the ocean affects us all. It, because it's affecting our climate, it's affecting hurricanes, it's affecting our food supply, it's, experience, it's affecting our experience when we go to the beach. But what we do also affects the ocean. We're affecting the ocean through the release of fossil, for the burning of fossil fuels and the release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're affecting the ocean through pollution and overfishing and a variety of other things. And no matter where we live, we're affecting the ocean. And so I really like this graph because it shows all the watersheds. So some of you may be from, say, Ohio or um, Montana. No matter where you live in the United States, or for that matter, you could have a similar map and other inhabited continents on the planet, we're all connected to the ocean because those rivers all collect all that fresh water, including plastic debris and nutrients and toxins and bad things. In the end, it winds up in the ocean. And so I, I, I felt it was important to set the stage in this way to let you know, you know what's happening in the ocean, at least sort of I'm sure you've read about it in bits and pieces, but just to pull it together in, in one bit of this talk. And of course, many of your students, those of you who are educators, know about these problems as well because they're all over the regular media and they're all over social media. So it's not like, I mean, it's not like people don't know about the problems. In fact, I sort of hear this every day when I, it used to be when I would say get in a cab to, to go somewhere, um, you know, or meet somebody and they ask me what I did, I say, I'm a marine biologist. And they say, oh, that's so exciting. And now when somebody asks me what I do and I say I'm a marine biologist, they're much more likely to say, wow, that must be a really depressing job. And, and it is depressing and, and maddening and disheartening. And I don't want to sugarcoat the scale of the problem. The problems that the oceans are facing, and really the planet at large, as was highlighted in the previous section, you know, they're, on the, they're, they're huge problems. They're like racism and banning books and all the other big problems that seem so big and we don't know what to do about them. And so we hear all this stuff about the problems, but what we're not really hearing about, and this is what I really want to talk about today, is about the solutions and the success, and actually not just the potential solutions, but the actual successes, the things we've achieved uh, in, in trying to solve these problems already. And the fact that we as educators and our students don't hear about the solutions, this is a problem. And I think Rebecca Peterson really illustrated that beautifully in the first session for those of you who were there. I mean, she said, and she said, you know, joy is the oxygen that makes hard work possible. Well, it's hard to feel very joyful if all you're thinking about is the problems. Not only that, it makes you feel like you can't do anything. It leads to, in kids, there's a whole phenomenon called, actually, just in grown-ups as well, eco-anxiety. But there are many young people who actually have told um, uh, one of my colleagues, for example, that they didn't, they were young and they said, you know, I don't think there's going to be a planet here when I grow up. Now, obviously, there'll be a planet, but it gives you a sense of the depth of the depression and the fear and the anxiety, and that's paralyzing. It doesn't lead to action, it leads to despair and, and in a sense, a, a, in a way of protecting yourself, kind of apathy. Because you know, if people don't feel any agency, if they don't feel like there's something they can do, they're not going to try. And so we really need to talk about what's, what is working and what could work, as well as what the problems are. And this is what I've really spent the last 15 years of my life doing. And what I want to do is share just a few examples to give you a sense. But these are the tip of the iceberg. There are so many success stories out there. Yes, there are individual success stories that are small still compared to the scope of the problem. But they are there, and they are growing. And we need to talk about them. So let's start with whales. Like everyone likes whales, right? So, and, and probably most of you know that we lost lots and lots of whales through whaling, and, and many species actually uh, were on the verge of extinction. But now, many, many whale species are on the road to recovery. And you see here a, a whale sort of checking out the Empire State Building. I mean, there are lots of whales right off of New York City and many other places. And in some places, whales are actually at numbers that match the levels before commercial whaling began. So that's one example where humans got together, they formed something called the International Whaling Commission, they prohibited the hunting of whales, almost all countries signed up, um, and as a result, whales have recovered. And now, even in those few countries that remain where they hunt whales to eat, the business of whale watching is worth a lot, lot more than the business of whale hunting. So here's another example, that's sea turtles. 
I mean, there are about 18 populations of different, about five different species of sea turtles. Two thirds of those populations are actually on the road to recovery. Now, how many of you actually knew that? When I give this talk, most people say, oh, I had no idea. I thought that all the sea turtles were in terrible shape. So here's a picture of the coast, a map of the coastline of Florida. All those places in color show you where sea turtles have been nesting. And on the right, you see that curve where you can see that it started, uh, the ESA stands for the Endangered Species Act. So we started protecting turtles in the late 1970s. And in Florida, which is what this, these data are for, there were almost no green sea turtles when that, work, when that protection began. Look at the numbers now. They're up to 30,000, 40,000. This is another example. For those of you who are at Rebecca Peterson's talk, she talked about exponential curves. That's an exponential curve. You know, exponential curves are what animals do when they reproduce. Two make four, four make eight, eight make, you know, it goes, gets bigger faster. And that's what the turtles are doing all over Florida. And these are, whales and turtles are just two examples. Now, sometimes those are examples where essentially we just stopped killing things and nature was able to rebound on its own. Sometimes we have to give nature a little bit of a helping hand. This is an example of a place that I was really lucky enough to visit uh, about a month ago. It's in Belize, uh, and it's a reef restoration site uh, that's uh, created by a, a nonprofit called the Fragments of Hope. Uh, started by a woman named Lisa Karn, who just decided she was going to do something about coral reefs in Belize. And she, she got community members together. She found money to pay them so they could actually earn money for restoring reefs. And they planted all these corals. And that reef now looks like the reefs I studied as a grad student in Jamaica in the 1970s. There are very few places in the Caribbean that look like that. But this is one of them. And so it's an amazing example of restoration. And it's a big part of what's happening in coral reef research right now. Another example, a little closer to home, the coast of Virginia. So seagrasses had disappeared from most of the coast of Virginia. But scientists worked on a way of figuring out how to collect seagrass seeds. They collected 70 million seagrass seeds. And they and the army of volunteers planted them on the Virginia coast, and they've restored 9,000 acres. And it's not just the seagrasses that are coming back. It's also the fish that we like to eat and the scallops we like to eat. And moreover, you heard briefly in a previous section about blue carbon. Well, those seagrasses take carbon dioxide out of the water, turn it into plant, and that plant material, when it dies, gets buried in the mud, and it's what's called sequestering carbon. It's taking carbon out of the atmosphere so that it no longer can warm the, the planet. So it's a good on a variety of different fronts. We're also getting better at managing fishing, because I'm not the kind of person, I mean, some marine biologists say we shouldn't eat anything in the ocean. I don't think that's true, and I think for many people, um, actually they depend entirely on seafood for their protein. In the US, at least, we've gotten much better at sustainably fishing. Uh, these are um, estimates from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, showing that about uh, you know, over 80% of the fish stocks in the United States are actually properly harvested. And then we're also getting better not only at protecting and properly managing uh, protecting ocean species and managing those we harvest, but also uh, in protecting entire marine ecosystems. Now, some of these are big and complicated efforts on the coast of California. All those little red dots, which are kind of tiny, but I hope you can see, are parts of a network of marine protected areas. But some of the places are really small, including the one on the right where I went when I was uh, visiting the University of Hong Kong. The students took me uh, to this tiny little marine protected area sitting between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, which are 20 million people. And this tiny little protected area is home to over 200 species of birds, which use this place to breed and to rest and to feed. And then, of course, the ocean has enormous potential to actually help us decarbonize our economy because it's so big and because winds blow over the ocean. This is a process that's well underway in Europe. In the United States, we're somewhat behind, but wind energy is coming on and coming on fast. And in addition, there are all sorts of other kinds of ocean energy, tidal energy, wave energy, which are still more in the development phase. I mean, wind energy is now much cheaper than fossil fuel energy, as is solar energy. And some of these other methods are not quite there yet uh, to make them commercially viable, but they're on the, on, on the way as well. And then finally, uh, in terms of thinking about the future, I was thrilled in the two panels back to see um, uh, an example of kind of the legacy of all this work on, on uh, thinking about successes and solutions that I've been engaged in for, you know, for over a decade. It started off, actually, because of students. When I was teaching students at the University of California, 
Um, I started off in kind of this, I used to give these lectures that were all about doom and gloom. In fact, my husband was the same way. He was also a scientist at the Smithsonian. We were called Doctors Doom and Gloom on the lecture circuit because everything we said was so depressing. And it wasn't, as I said, there's lots you could be depressed about. But as I gave these lectures um, to the students, I started thinking, oh, wow, they, th this is not necessarily what they really want to hear. I, I can see them almost sinking in their seats with these little bubbles over their heads saying, why did I decide to do this for a career? This is so upsetting and depressing, and there's nothing I can do about these problems. And in fact, I've had students since then tell me that they almost left the field of, of conservation, but wasn't for the fact that we started focusing on solutions rather than problems. So this led me to create a whole series of symposium called Beyond the Obituary, Success Stories in Ocean Conservation. And that led to a Twitter campaign called Hashtag Ocean Optimism. And then when I moved back to the Smithsonian in 2007, I was part of a group of people that helped uh, to build conservation uh, across the board. And we launched something called the Earth Optimism Initiative. And so much of what I do is actually now not necessarily ocean related. I have a whole, whole you know, buckets of success stories that I can tell you about. Uh, success on land, and we heard two of them in the previous section, one on the bison recovery and one on the recovery of the Anacostia River, and there are tons of examples like that as well. So we held the, the inaugural Earth Optimism Summit in 2017, uh, and then there were two, unfortunately the pandemic kicked in, so the subsequent summits were all virtual, uh, but they're all available online. And, um, and then that Earth Optimism Summit sort of planted some of the seeds that led to the Life on a Sustainable Planet initiative, which you just heard about in the previous session. And then this, I was so excited to hear, I think her name was Jessie, she was on the stage, and she said, and she, in the I am section, she said, I am president of the Earth Optimism Club. So here is Earth Optimism, the, the, the summits leading into this all this educational material. And I was very, uh, this program is called the Earth Optimism uh, youth Action and Leadership Program, and they just won an award from uh, Dr. Monique Chisholm uh, for the work they're doing in the Smithsonian. So to me, it's like to see all this, and, it's, and of course, it's not just the stuff that, that I and my colleagues have done. I mean, there's movements like this all, all over the place. You can see in, in journalism, there's something called Solutions Journalism. David Burns started a program called Reasons to be Cheerful. So if you're looking for things to inspire your students about what they can do and what's working, there are lots of resources out there for you. So here are a few, the Smithsonian's Ocean Portal, which is something I helped lead when I was uh, working here, is shown here. Also, I wrote a science article called Ocean Optimism, Moving Beyond the Obituaries. Um, and um, that, I wrote it, in, it's open access, and I also wrote it without any jargon. So I think any of you could understand it. It's not a technical thing. And then, of course, wherever you're working, there are conservation organizations. I happen to be on the board of the Nature Conservancy, and they have um, uh, operations in every state in the, in the United States and also around the world. But there's something called the uh, Blue Movement Directory, which, which just got re released, which has a lot of information about different organizations around the world also doing ocean conservation. And of course, you can just go online and look for hashtag ocean optimism and hashtag earth optimism to find more examples. So um, I guess I want to leave you with two messages. The first is, you know, we all have a role to play. Some of us play a role as scientists or communicators, some as artists, uh, some as policymakers, management, or just being there and talking to your friends and family. We all, there's something that all of us can do. And I'm so excited to see, hear examples in this summit of the various things that are happening in educational spaces around the country. And the other really important message, particularly for young people, is to remind them, not only they have a role to play, but it's not too late. And so with that, I'd like to close, and uh, we can take questions. Thank you. All right, so on behalf of the virtual audience, we have two questions. And of course, um, colleagues here in the auditorium can also ask questions as well. Feel free to just hop up to the mic. Um, so the first question is, how can educators collaborate with local environmental organizations or experts to enrich students' learning experiences on climate change? So if you have any good examples, I think you gave a few, but just any suggestions or ways to get started for a teacher who's kind of, you know, dipping their toe in the water, so to speak. Why don't you, why don't you start with the Smithsonian resources and then... Yeah, you know, if they're an educator, absolutely sharing some of the resources, especially, I think, 
in a classroom of other students that have done things in their uh, environment or in their, you know, their specific communities. Because I think so much of that is, you know, they, they just feel so disconnected, especially if they're not even on an ocean, right? Like, what is it that these students have done or stories that, that these, in, these communities have done to, to help their specific community? And that really shows that they're, they're all, you know, we're all working together. Uh, Ocean Portal, like she had mentioned, is a great place for that. There's lots of really good stories shared there. Um, maybe the Learning Lab as well is a, another place that other educators uh, have made collections about things that they've done um, in their classrooms that have been effective. And, and what I mentioned in terms of, I mean, there are lots of uh, non-government organizations, nonprofits. Some of them are really big, like the Nature Conservancy. But the thing about the Nature Conservancy is it's really big, but it's a collection of much smaller things. So it's a lot more, it's, it can be quite approachable. Every state in the United States, the Nature Conservancy has a chapter, so you can reach out. And, um, and then just, you know, I just, um, as I, I mentioned, the Blue Movement Directory, which has a, is a comprehensive listing of all the different entities working in marine conservation. Um, and, I, you know, there are, on land, there are land trusts, um, and um, if you just look online, depending on where you are, you'll be able to find things that are going on nearby, and then just reach out to people, because, you know, this is work, as it was said in the last panel, man, we need all hands on deck. And so people are always excited about, um, uh, about the opportunities to collaborate outside any one of these organizations, the Nature Conservancy included. You know, the whole, um, you know, the whole Belize office, for example, uh, and, that, and that doesn't even include the Fragments of Hope project, is only about six or seven people. I mean, most of these things you think of it's big, but they're actually, the number of people working on any particular thing is small, and they can always use help. Great, I'll go to the next question, too. Uh, Joy Online asks, are there any data sets that you know of that are publicly released for use by teachers and students to help get them started and make math connections? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, NOAA has a lot of data sets, and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and NASA also has lots of publicly available data sets. Um, and then I think that, for example, the eMammal, um, not eMammal, but the eNatural, what's it called now? The natural, the data. E natural yeah. Yeah, well, also the program for the camera traps. All the data, when you contribute to it, the data is, is sitting there available. So all the citizen science programs usually have, you know, when you contribute data, it's not like it goes into a black box. You get to see the other data that's being contributed. So there's, there are a ton of different possibilities depending on what people are interested in. And then actually the one source of data which I think is really, which I've, I'm working on a book on success stories in conservation, it's taking me forever, but I hope to finish it sometime. Um, but one of the sources that I've used for interest, which I think is really good for students, I mean sometimes raw data is a little bit, you know, kind of overwhelming to digest if you're a teacher, but this is called Our World in Data. And it, it just has data on everything, graphs, I mean, everything. Uh, and um, so it's worth just jumping into that data set and just exploring it in all sorts of different topics, not just about the environment, actually. Great, another question. Um, you spoke about focusing on the solutions to climate change. As educators, how do we strike the balance between presenting the urgency of climate change without overwhelming students with fear? And I think this is a question you're well suited for, Nancy. <laughs> I, get, I, don't think there, I don't think I've ever given a talk where I haven't been asked about how to balance the, the communication about the urgency and the magnitude of the problem with the possibility of doing something about it, especially in light of the fact that the problem is still much bigger in scale than the solutions. Although some of these solutions, for example, the deployment of renewable energy is increasing incredibly rapidly. And there are you know, s certain groups of animals, for example, which have recovered uh, fantastically. But still, we're in the middle of a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. So what I always try to do is I, I begin sort of acknowledging the scale of the problem. And I usually end as well, sort of, sort of reminding people that you know, there's a lot of work to do, but it's not too late. And then, but, I fill the, but I fill the middle of what I, when I'm talking about it with examples of success. And the reason I, and so it's not necessarily, time is not proportional to, you know, time I spend is not proportional to 
the, the elements of what I'm talking about. And that's because if I, all, if I did it that way, then it would all be bad news and I could tack a little bit of good news on the end. So that's sort of the way a lot of nature documentaries are. I find them very frustrating. And all this horrible stuff and then like five minutes later, oh, this little thing. But um, it, so, and the reason I do that is because social scientists have, have discovered it and, and actually you can see this in the way social media work is. Negative news is a lot stickier, a lot more powerful. Uh, and so if you give people, um, if you give people too much, you know, if you, if you sort of overwhelm people with bad news, even if you throw some good news in there here and there, it doesn't stick. They, re they come back remembering all the bad stuff. And so you really have to tell the, you know, to give space. And I loved what, what uh, Rebecca Peterson said, one good thing. You have to give space for that one good thing. Even if there's been a ton of bad things, you have to let it, let it be out there and let it breathe. I mean, I start my day, for example. I don't get out of, I mean, I can afford this to do this because I'm retired. I know some of you have to set alarms at five o'clock in the morning, but I always find one piece of good environmental news before I get up and another piece of good environmental news before I go to sleep. And that's how I bracket my day. And it's how I keep it centered. I read about all the bad news. I'm aware of what's going on. It's not like I'm ignoring it, but I make sure to give breathing room to the positive things that are happening in the planet because that's the way for more positive things to happen. Excellent. We have a, an overflow of questions from the virtual audience, so I'll just keep going and hopefully if there's we somebody can get else to in the many. audience, if you stand up by the microphone. Yes, so. absolutely. Um, so uh, one question, and I think this is more for you too, Cody. Um, have there been any examples of educators uh, using the game and the interactive and any advice for how to get started and implement it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, my colleague Drew Robarge and I, who's co-designed the game, he developed the game. Um, we took it to a classroom of, I think, fourth graders when we were originally designing it. And if you ever want brutal, honest <laughs> reactions, bring it to a class of fourth graders. Uh, but we, you know, anytime you're developing something, you want to play test it as, as, you're, as you're going along. Uh, but they had a lot of fun. They totally broke the game. They found every single possible thing that was wrong with it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. They had a great time. But we brought it back to the, to the lab and, and kept developing it. And we brought it back to the same group of, uh, of fourth graders, I don't know, like six months later or so. And I think they really appreciated seeing, you know, that they had that kind of voice in, in the development of it, but also that, oh, I can't like go off two miles off in one direction anymore. I have to like kind of stay in this coral reef. Um, it, it launched just before COVID. So we had all these other classrooms lined up that we then just had to, you know, evaporate because everything went completely digital. And at the same time, we had a host of teachers that were calling and saying like, what do you have digitally that we can give our kids that are all remote? And so we really did see like a huge spike in numbers. I didn't actually go to those classrooms, but I saw the numbers like go up uh, right, right directly after COVID. Um, so I, I actually kind of want to hear back from them of what that experience was like, because I just, I wasn't in those classrooms, but. Uh, but yeah, implement it. Go, you know, if, if you're online, uh, go to the column on the right where it, it shows where the resources are and it gives you links. And all you have to do is go to the link and you can put it in your classroom. Uh, totally facilitated from there. And it sounds like, too, you can use the game just by itself, Correct. but you could also use all of the supplementary resources and the video um, of Career Pathways with Nancy, too. So that's great. It's kind of modular in that way. Um, all right. So let's see. Uh, another question, and I'm sure both of you are familiar with this question too. Um, are there any specific roadblocks that educators might encounter when trying to educate students on climate change? Perhaps parental resistance, and any advice on how to overcome those types of challenges? Yeah, I, I think um, I'll start, and then yeah. um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, angst remorse, sort of hand-wringing among the climate science community about how, despite the fact that they've been talking about climate change for literally decades, um, there is still so much resistance. Now, part of that has been due to sort of an organized political movement to stop progress on fighting climate change. But it's also the case that for some people, they just have it, the, the, 
it just sort of violates their worldview that the idea that humans could be changing the climate and that we should be doing something about it. There's a woman named uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who's, she's the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. She's also a climate scientist, and she's also an evangelical. And she has a lot of resources on the web about how to talk about climate. She also has a book called Saving Us, which is really good about talking about how to talk about climate. If I had to take all of what she's written and talked about and, and, um, and sort of collapse it into one uh, sort of the, into the essence of it, is to don't start with the data. <laughs> you know, as scientists, it's actually really hard to, to kind of incorporate that. We're trained to create data. We love data. You know, we're data geeks. But data is not the way to start when you're trying to have a conversation about climate change with somebody who's kind of it's at least at the very least skeptical and maybe outright hostile. Um, I mean, there's some people that you're, you might, I, mean, I think they're probably 10% of the, in the United States, the population you just can't reach. But most people are now sort of in the sort of, they might be skeptical, they might be uh, ambivalent, they might think it's still not a big of an issue. But the way to, but, but you, you don't want to begin with the data because that's how, not how most people think. Um, most people think in stories as something has been brought up. And so what she recommends doing is you know, using the power of story, the power of narrative, and then also beginning with shared values. I have a, a colleague uh, named Randy Olson who talks about, he, he works on communication from the perspective of narrative in a very technical sense. You know, what, is a, what is a story? We talk about stories all the time. What's a story? Well, he actually talks about stories in a sort of anatomical sense. What is a story? And he always says that um, you begin with agreement. So you begin with, if you're talking to whoever your audience is, a person, an individual person or group, you begin with shared values. So for example, Catherine Hayhoe, who lives in West Texas in a very conservative place, usually begins talking about how much she loves living in West Texas and the landscape. And it's only then that she brings in, but you know, there's things that are happening, things are changing, it's getting hot, it's getting hard to live here. Why is that? And then she bring, you know, and then she brings other elements in. So it starts with agreement. And then it begins, and then it's only then that you enter the conflict, which actually, the, so he talks about and, but, therefore. So the, the landscape is beautiful and we love living here, but things are changing. Therefore, we need to start thinking about ways of doing things differently. So it's and, but, therefore is a narrative structure. And it tends to you know, get people on board, and then you can sort of uh, introduce them to the concept that there's, there's, something, there's something that's not quite right. Interestingly, you know, uh, the book um, Silent Spring, which uh, Rachel Carson wrote, really the founding of the environmental movement. If you read it, I mean, most of us read it a long time ago. Um, you sort of forget how it's structured. Actually, that first chapter begins with this beautific description of farmlands in America and, and, and you know, sheep and chickens and trees and bird singing. And then she says, but then a horrible plague descended upon the landscape. Uh, and you know things started dying, and then the rest of the book is, of course, the therefore. You know this is because of um, of uh, pesticides, and we need to do something about it. So always, if you can, begin. Don't begin with the with the problems, with the conflict. Begin with the areas where you can agree and where where people are. That then they're open, and then once they're open, then you can move forward into the harder part of the conversation. The other thing I wanted to mention before I forget another resource. If you're looking for a resource on the environment, both bad news and good news, it, the Mongabay website, I think, is the best environmental uh, website out there. And it has things from all over the world. Hmm? Mongabay, M-O-N-G-A-B-A-Y. And it just has you know, tons of news stories. And you can search it by you know, mangroves or energy. It's, energy and it's both climate and biodiversity. And it, a lot of work, actually, very important. Uh, they made a point of cut a lot of coverage of indigenous people and environmental justice in addition to sort of the biology side of, of conservation. You know, lots of success stories. The other thing about success that I think is really powerful is that um, you know, there's a whole, in screenwriting, um, uh, this is something else that Randy introduced me to. There's this whole concept of the hero's journey, which begins in an ordinary world, and then something bad happens, and they struggle, and then they, at the end, come out, and everything is good again. So Aaron Brockovich, for example, 
is a movie. I mean, Hollywood knows the hero's dream. That's how they make their money. So they know how to tell stories so that people want to buy tickets. So Aaron Brockovich, for which you know, got an uh, Academy Award for Julia Roberts, you know, is this housewife, single woman who you know, gets a job at a legal firm because she needs to pay her rent. And then she starts digging into the files. And she goes from this ordinary world, of, which was kind of hard, but still ordinary, to this world of all this uh, corporate deception and poisoning of wells. And then in the end, the company sues the, the uh, Pacific Gas Electric for millions of dollars. And then now she actually even went um, and uh, talked to the people in East Palestine when the train with all those terrible chemicals dumped over. So she has a whole career in doing it. But that is the hero's journey. Her, her journey is the hero's journey. And the thing about conservation success, which I think is why it relates so strongly, why students can relate to it and why anybody can relate to it, Every single one of those stories is a story of one or a few people on a hero's journey. And so it's a very compelling way to talk about the environment, much more compelling than data and much more compelling than just drowning people with statistics about how bad things are. Nancy, perfect introduction to this next question. So the emphasis on storytelling makes me think that there's some connections I could do with other teachers down the hall in social studies, ELA, and art. Do you have any ideas or examples? What role can humanities folks play in science communication? Oh, a huge <laughs> role. And one of the, actually, I have to say one of the proudest things I am, I'm very proud of earth optimism and ocean optimism and all that stuff. I'm, but the other thing I did when I was, uh, before I retired from the Smithsonian, when I first got to the Na uh, Natural History Museum, I knew from my days out in California about this project called the Hyperbolic Crochet Coral Reef. And, um, and it, two twin sisters from Australia, very concerned about, um, about the, what was happening to corals. And, and then they discovered the work of the mathematician at Cornell University who showed that all, many sea creatures have what's, well, she was a mathematician, this whole thing called hyperbolic geometry, and they thought it was just an abstract concept that couldn't be visualized or made concrete. And she discovered that crocheting, I don't know how many of you crochet, if you crochet in such a way like you're adding stitches, so instead of stick, like a flat sheet, the, 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 what you're creating gets all ripply and roughly. That's a lot of ocean creatures are built like that because it maximizes their ability to catch food and, and get oxygen into their tissues. Anyway, so they decided, they realized that you know hyperbolic geometry and, and coral reef organisms had this zone of low overlap. And they had this program of creating these uh, crocheted coral reefs in various public spaces. So we invited them to create the hyperbolic crochet coral reef at the Natural History Museum. It was a big deal, actually, because at the time, I have to say, um, that there was some skepticism about bringing a bunch of crochet into the Natural History Museum. You know, this isn't really science. But it was one of the most successful exhibits that we ever ran. It had a healthy, you know, part of it was all beautifully colored to symbolize a healthy reef. Part of it, um, was um, white to symbolize coral bleaching, and part of it was made out of pla crocheted plastic to symbolize pollution. And I have to say that one of my, the, you know, I've had a certain amount of you know things that happen in the press where mentioning things that I've you know been involved in. But the thing I'm, I think I'm most proud of was an article. So we so we had a I'm sorry go back. We had some people go out and con contact community groups all over wa the Washington area, broadly speaking. And, um, and reach out to them and ask them to contribute. So in the end, there were something like um, uh, 7,000 pieces and maybe 1,000 or 500, a lot of different people from three to 85 or something, a huge age range, but also a lot of different socioeconomic backgrounds. So one of the pieces of press that I'm most proud of was an article in Street Sense um, which is the magazine in Washington by and for homeless people, those of you who aren't from here. Uh, you can probably find it being sold, you know, still on the streets. Um, and there was a front page article, and it said, homeless women stitch their way into the Smithsonian. And I felt that was magical. I mean, I just, it, dropped, it still brings me to tears when I think about it. So that's an example of the arts, but there are lots of examples in music. Uh, there's all sorts of environmental music. There's a, there is a woman, an indigenous young girl who sang these amazing haunting songs about the future of the ocean in the Pacific Northwest where she lived. I mean, there's just tons and tons of work in the environmental humanities. And actually, what's, a lot of it has tended to be sort of about the problem, but increasingly in that world as well. In fact, 
you see it, uh, for example, in film, science fiction about the environment is usually very dystopian and negative, but there's this whole movement now talking about how to incorporate progress and solutions into science fiction in such a way that the, so the end point is, oh, isn't just the death of humanity or the planet. So there is, there is, you don't have to be a scientist. I mean, in social science, most of what I do, I have to say I read a lot of social science because most of what I do depends on understanding how people respond to the problems rather than the problems themselves. As I used to tell my teachers, you know, conservation is not, I mean, my students, um, conservation is not about changing the behavior of whales, it's about changing the behavior of people. So you have to know social science. So natural science, social science, humanities, everything across the board. Excellent, thank you. We have time for, for one more question. Um, Cody, it's evident that a lot of time and effort has gone into producing the game. How long did it take to develop? Um, but also, how do you choose which stories to feature and what's next? Oh my gosh, so long. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, Nancy, I, I, I'm guessing from the first time I emailed you to uh, the, the launch pre right before COVID, I would say about a year. Um, it's, it's a lot of work for like a 30 minute interactive. Um, you know, you really want to get the science right. You want to get the learning goals correct. And then in the production of the game itself, you have 3D models, you have audio files that need to be recorded, scripts to write, development, like I, I mentioned with my friend Drew. And then the launch of it, you need to play test. You need, you know, so there's so many different elements. It takes a long time to do it right. And uh, yeah, it takes a long time. Um, what's next? We want to do more. We, we have so many amazing scientists. I was on a tour uh, Tuesday with this really incredible uh, vertebrate um, forensic scientist that studies birds and, and uh, you know what happens when airplanes hit birds and her job is to like investigate kind of what bird that was and what went wrong and I was like my ears just were like immediately like that's a game uh, <laughs> the stuff that they pull off and out of the engine is called snarge which I thought was just such a good word that's an anagram of snot and garbage and I you know kids love that kind of thing so in my mind I was like okay we might have to have a conversation later uh, but yeah so many amazing scientists that we have here at the Smithsonian but not just scientists we have historians artists I would also love to you know tell some of those stories as well so excellent thank you both so much thank you thank you all for coming and thank you all online <laughs> <laughs>